trading at its best. So hope everybody had a, a good weekend. Um, we've got a pretty important topic today that I think will help a lot of you understand the markets a lot more. So let's go ahead and take a look at what that is. Uh, real quick, for those of you that are, this is your first time to the webinar, I'm Mike Swanson, founder of Trade West Forex, and you've probably seen our Momentix software that we've been um, working with the last couple weeks. Otherwise, uh, let's just, if not, we can talk about that later, but today we're going to be talking about what, pri what makes price move. So some of the things we're going to be looking at, we're going to be mainly looking at a a trading platform that's not MetaTrader. We're going to be looking at Dukascopy, and we'll show you how you can set that up. Um, but we're going to talk about the ECN versus the bucket shop brokerages, the driving force behind price, and then how the spread is created. So these are some of the things we're going to be talking about today. If you reviewed the blog, um, you should be able to have seen, get a little bit of a summary about what we're going to be doing today. So let me let me actually bring this up over here real quick. Here is the blog. It's tradewestforex.com slash blog. This is where you can sign up for the weekly webinars and, and get a little summary of the topic that we're going to be covering. Okay, so what we're going to talk about first here is what creates the spread. And so what m most people think is that the spread is made up by the brokerages. So let me bring up a trading platform here. So here's your spread. You know, you got the bid price and the ask price. Everybody's familiar with this, and you'll see there's always a difference between the two. Some brokerages, it's a few pips. Others, it's less than a pip, and it depends on the, uh, it depends on the, sorry about that. The chart should be up now. It depends on the, 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 uh, the pair that you're trading, the brokerage you're with, and the, usually the time of the day even, depending on where liquidity's at. So, but what a lot of people have been taught is that the brokerages determine this. This is how they make their money. They can uh, put the spread at whatever they want. And now that is half true because in the last couple of years, there's been a lot of brokerages weeded out of the business that operated that way where they, they were allowed to set the price. You know, they could move the price around, take out stops and different things like that. There are still some brokerages that do that. And those are the brokerages we call bucket shops. And not only are they, you know, just manipulating the spread, but they they are trading against you. So if you buy, they don't put your order into the rest of the market like an ECN does. They actually take the opposite side of your trade. So it's in their best interest that you lose on the trade because obviously they'll make money. And so that's a big conflict of interest, and a lot of those brokerages were weeded out when the ECN trend began, and a lot of the laws were passed with U.S. brokerages and things like that. But the ECN is the Electronic Communication Network, and what that is is it's a place where a lot of brokerages and liquidity sources are um, showing their bids and offers, and then they are trans or transmitting that directly to your broker or to your feed that you see so that you're seeing the raw actual prices that you can trade at. And now they don't take the trade against you. Since it's the ECN type of setup, they are going to match your order with someone else in the liquidity pool. And I'll explain this stuff here in more detail on these charts. Dukascopy has a good, a really nice platform to be able to see all this stuff, see all the transparency. Okay, but basically that's a much better situation. Now your brokerage doesn't care if you make or lose money. In fact, they usually want you to make money so you'll continue trading with them. Um, and the way they make money instead of trading against you is by charging you a commission on the trade. So they'll charge, you know, between a couple tenths of a pip to seven tenths or maybe even a full pip depending on your brokerage. But they'll just charge you a commission, a flat rate commission on the trade. And that way, you know what they're making. They're not, you don't have to worry about them moving the price and the spread and different things like that. So when you know you're with the right brokerage, if you see the spread, say on the euro dollar, go to 10 pips, I'm going to explain why that happens and that you know it's not your broker. Most of the time it's not going to be your broker messing with you, especially if you're with a decent brokerage. Dukascopy, for example, is one that has a lot of liquidity sources. They act as a liquidity provider to many other brokerages. 
and they have something called centralized liquidity, which means you can offer liquidity to the rest of the market by placing an offer or placing a bid instead of taking the bid or offer. So what that means is they even have more liquidity available because retail traders, you know, uh, everyday traders can get on here and offer liquidity. And I'll show you how that works too. Okay, so hopefully this makes a little bit of sense that uh, the differences between bucket shops and ECNs. Now let me try to explain here how the spread itself is generated. Okay, we can demonstrate this by placing bids and offers. This is just on a demo account on the J4X Dukascopy platform. And you can go to dukascopy.com and open a demo in order to do this. Um, but what we can see here is this is the best price that I can sell at. The bid price, if I want to sell at market right now, this is the best available price that I can do that at. And if I want to buy at the ask price, that's the best price I can do that at. Now there's another piece here that you might not be familiar with because of this centralized liquidity where I can place a bid and an offer. And what that allows me to do is not pay the spread, and in fact, I'll be offering a better price than the existing uh, prices you see. Let me, let's, just, let's just do a demonstration so you can see how this works. So I'm going to put in the amount in millions here uh, is, you know, if I do a million, that's 10 standard lots. And so I'm just going to put in, we'll go point 0.1. And what you're going to see here, I'm going to place an offer. And what that's telling the market is I'm going to take a sell trade when somebody buys at the price I offer. Okay, I'm going to offer a price for the market to buy at, and that's going to make me put a sell trade in. So it's going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put an offer in at a better price than the current price, and that's going to shrink the spread. And you're going to see my point one is going to show up here at the top. Okay, so watch how this works. I'm going to put it in just a little bit lower than the current price. I'm going to put it at 93.5, and I'm going to do 0.1. Okay, watch what happens here. There you go, 93.5 and 0.1. Do you see what happened? I shrunk the spread. Now, this is just a demo. This is not going to happen on the real market unless I've got real, a real account and real money on the line here. But this demo allows me to simulate the same thing. I'm now the best price. I'm the 0.1 at 93.5. If somebody buys right now, that will put me in a sell trade. Okay, let me see if we can bring up the order window here. Let's see, portfolio. Oops, not gonna. Okay, let me see. It might just be hiding. There it is. Okay, so there's my position summary. Positions. It says I'm gonna go short at 93.5. So see, now that the market moved down, as it's moving down, I've put this pressure on the market, and the more uh, pressure on the market, the greater chances the market's going to move the opposite direction. I'll explain that more. That's about price movement. Let's make sure we understand spread here first. Okay, so see, now somebody else came in and offered a better price to sell at, or to buy at. Now it's at 92.6. So if I want to modify my order, uh, let's see. Okay, if I want to go in here and we'll place another offer. So I actually got filled on that one and made a few pips. But let's let's bump this down again. Let's do the same thing. We'll do it on the other side as well. But I'm going to put in. Uh, this is one standard lot. It's a hundred thousand in currency. So the current best price is ninety two five. So it's already I already can't go tighter than that. Somebody already just put an order in. Um, now it went off, so let's try it now, okay? 92.5, there you go. And looks like I got filled. So somebody took my offer. Does this make sense? Let me know if you guys have questions so far. I'll, I'll do some more examples on the bid. But the price is moving pretty actively, and it's already a pretty tight spread. Maybe we'll try another pair. Um, but this is what creates the spread. It's the bids and offers, not people taking the bid and offer, but the actual orders that are available in the market. And what we call these is limit orders. Um, it doesn't always have to be somebody placing a bid or offer. It can be limit orders for existing trades that they have. You know, for example, if you're over here buying, you might have a limit order to take profit up here, right? Oops. OK, 
Okay, you might have a limit order right there to take profit because you bought here, you want to sell there. That order will act as a limit order to sell at a higher price. So a limit order to sell offers liquidity to the market. And you will see that in this market depth, which I'll explain here in a minute. Okay, so let's do, let's get another pair and try another example here. Let's go to something that has a wider spread, maybe the pound yen. That's pretty tight too, but that's okay. We'll use, let's try the pound yen. Okay, so we're going to do it on the bid this time. I'm going to place a bid to the market, which tells the market, I want to buy at the price they sell at. So I'm going to place a bid in the market. So I'll just put another point one in here, and I will go, let's see, 29.5 is a little bit higher than the market price, right? I could even move it up to 30 if I want. I could move it a full pip. Okay, we'll go 0.30. I'll move the price a full pip. It's moving kind of fast now. Let's bump it up. Let's go 31, about a full pip. Oh, market moved again. <laughs> Looks like I got filled though. Somebody took my order and I'm already up a bit. I'll just close that out. This is all just a demo. I mean, this stuff is, it might look like, oh, you know, this is the best thing you could ever do is skip the spread, but it's sometimes you're not going to get filled. Somebody's going to have a better price. You know, the more competitive that the bidding and offering is, the tighter the spread. And that's why some of these brokerages like Dukascopy and ECNs can offer you such tight spreads. Okay, but let's try this one more time. Let's bid. See if price can slow down for us for a minute. <laughs> okay, let's let's try 32.6 bid. We'll go to the point one. Up, oh, it's up to 32.2. Okay, 32.6. There I am. And so see now my order to buy did not get filled because now there's a better price to sell at. So see, I'd have to modify this. I wish the market was going a little slower so we could. Moving a little slower so we could demonstrate this better, but I think you guys should be getting the idea here. Let's try another pair that's not so active. Um, you can see this one's just really moving around a lot. Let's see. Let's try. Let's grab another. Let's try uh, some of these exotic pairs. Okay. This one's moving too, but at least it's got a wider spread. So let's try this again. Let's place a bid, and we're going to put it about a pip above the price, 0.1. You're going to see my order come on right there. So now I'm the best bid. So I will stay there until somebody offers a better price to sell at, which would be higher than me. Otherwise, if somebody pushes this button right here, if they take that liquidity from me, they, they will fill me on the uh, buy side, and that uh, the next available bid would show up. Okay, so this is just one concept, this, but this is really important to understand first because it's going to explain next what actually is moving the price. Okay, so if you haven't, if you guys have any questions, if you're a little bit confused, if you need some more examples or a better explanation, just use the chat and let me know. Okay, so you see I'm still the best available bid. I'm the point one at 52.3. Now I could I could make this I could tighten this spread up even more by modifying my order. So I could go in and bump it up a tenth. So now I went to 52.4. So how many of you this is new information about the spread and how I can actually move and manipulate the spread myself through centralized liquidity? which, uh, you know, Duke Copy offers this. There's a few brokerages that offer this. Um, but this is what's happening, even if you can't do this on your platform, you know, if you're on MetaTrader, for example, you can't offer liquidity to the market. But the same thing is happening behind the scenes with all the liquidity providers. That's what's moving the spread around. And, uh, you know, there's different bids coming in. Somebody hits the uh, market order, takes the bid, the next price shows up. And let me show you that part now. Let me show you what happens when somebody takes my order. What, may, what happens after somebody hits sell and takes my, uh, my bid? 
Well, you look down here at what's called the market depth. Okay, so right here, market depth tells us where the next available prices will be ahead of time. We can see people that have placed uh, bids and offers already. And so, for example, if, if somebody goes to 52.5, I'm going to show up down here as 52.4. I'm just going to be another order in the market depth. So you'll see that there are 3 million in bids roughly at 76.50, two, two pips lower. These are people that placed bids below the price at a worse price than, uh, than it's currently at. So those act as limit orders or it could be centralized liquidity. So if it's a limit order, it could be somebody that sold um, or bought with a stop loss. Okay? So it's an order out there to sell. Um, you know, actually, sorry, the other way around. It could be that uh, they actually want to buy, so they are selling with a limit order to take profit at these prices. Okay, so this could, you got to remember, these are not, on the bid side, it's not orders to sell, it's orders to buy at these prices, right? When I place a bid, you'll see here I'm buying. But if I click the bid, I'm selling. Hopefully this stuff's not too confusing, it's, but it's really important to understand. So if, you, if you're confused, let me know and I can make sure we clarify this stuff for you. Okay, so bids are on the uh, market depth are orders to buy. They're either limit orders to enter the market or to exit. Okay, uh, you get market depth, you can get it on this platform um, just on Dukascopy. You get download their demo and um, it should show up right here on the, on the panel on the left. Your bid is higher but others are filling first. Um, let's see. Are you trying? I don't want to follow you exactly how. So yeah, if, if I mean, if my bid, if I'm the highest bid, the best available bid, then I show up right here as the best available price to sell at. And so if somebody clicks that, then they take my order off the books and it goes to the next price. So see here, I'm the best available order on the books. If somebody takes my order, price is going to move down to 76.50.6, uh, you know, 76.506. That's where the next liquidity level is at uh, for people that want to sell at the market. And then that might change, though. Somebody else might come in and do what I did and offer a better price. That'll move the bid back up. So, yeah, I'm on, I'm on the top of the, yeah, I'm, I'm the best, best available price, so I'm on the top of this. Same thing for the ask. You'll see that the prices actually get bigger as you go down on the ask, smaller as you go down on the bid. It's because they're showing, that they're showing the best price that's available to the market to buy or sell at at any given time. So see, 52.9 is the current ask price. 52.4, my order, is the current bid price. If my order gets taken by the market clicking here, or somebody in another platform, you know, another liquidity source, takes my order, then my order will disappear off of here. The new bid price will be 50, you know, 507. You can see it's all changing really rapidly, but that will then show up here, or this next available price will move up to here. Same with the ask side. If somebody takes this guy's order, which I could demonstrate that, the next available price shows up. So watch what happens here. I'm going to delete my order, and you're going to see the price move to this 509, that next available price, 508 now. There you go, 508. Price moved down, spread widened and then new orders will come in and maybe fill that gap. So you might start to already see where I'm going with this on how price moves, um, but there's a little bit more to it than this, and I'll explain here in just a minute. Let's just make sure everybody understands this concept. Um, let's try actually taking liquidity. Okay, I'm going to take, uh, I want to take the liquidity off of the book here, or off of the top price, and you'll see that will also move it to the next available price, okay? So let's see, I'd have to, I'd have to buy 1.7 million, and that would move the price to uh, 54.3. Let's just try that. That'll move it to 54.3, about a half a pip. So let's do 1.7. I don't know if I have enough in this account to do that, but let's try. 53.8. Okay, so 53.4, let's see, next price will be 53.8. So I'll take 53.4. 
Um, let's see. So it's 53.4. So yeah, now it's 53.6. Okay, so let me close this. Let's try that again. Okay, 1.7, 53.5. It's moving around. <laughs> if we take 1.7 at 53.4, that would, let's see, 53.2. Okay. Um, so you'll see that right now on the, I think on the demo, I'd have to make sure on this, but I think on the demo when you take liquidity, it does not affect the market. Um, well, I mean, not you know, doesn't doesn't affect the demo market, the demo the demo feed. Where, where placing a liquidity does, you know, placing placing a bid or offer, if sits here and affects the spread. But I'm not 100% now on taking liquidity if that's going to really move it to the next price. Since obviously you're not doing anything to the market. Um, let's try one more time. We'll just we'll be able to confirm that. So if we take the 1.7 to 53.5, yeah, so it's not going to, on the demo, nothing's going to happen when you take the liquidity. Anyways, but you, that's how it works in the real environment. If this was a live account and I were to buy 1.7, you know, 17 standard lots at that price, basically if I take this liquidity at this price, the price will move to the next one. Or, like I said, the other way, is if this person deletes their order, just like I did. I can put my bid in here, bump it up to 51 to move it up a pip, put a million in there, or a uh, hundred thousand. Okay, now I'm the best available bid. I move the price up. So either somebody needs to take my liquidity to move price down, take my order, or if I cancel my order, see that will also move the price back to the next price, next available bid. So is this all making sense? how the spread is formed, how market depth works, those kind of go together. If so, we will move on to the next concept. Let's see. What is the edge of having market depth? Well, there are some different things you can do with it, but we're not going to really cover that today. But I'll tell you that mainly it's, it's an edge for, uh, for traders that have larger accounts when you're going to be trading these large sizes because you can come in here either you know you can take some off the market and you could also place bids and offers some of the strategies that liquidity providers banks and different things that they do is they will put pressure on the market you know something like this down here they've got six million two pips higher the market cannot move above there until that or those orders are filled Okay, so let's let's move on to the next concept. That that's where I can explain this, and you'll see how market depth can help you a little bit. Um, you know, as as far as understanding what kind of strategies people are using with market depth. Let's make sure I can answer all these questions. Though, let's see. Um, so, if somebody comes in with a fifty lot position. Someone's asking, could they move the price aggressively? Well, that would show up most likely as a short-term uh, spread gap. Uh, if, just, if it's just a single order comes in and buys up all the liquidity in here, 50 million, takes up all the bid or the ask, then that's going to put a gap in the spread, and then the market's going to have to decide what to do about that. Is new, you know, our new offers going to show up and bring the price right back down, or our new bids going to show up, moving the price up? Okay, that's what's. That's exactly what here we're gonna we're gonna show you how uh, exactly what moves the price is those decisions of the market. If somebody starts taking liquidity, it's either uh, offers come in to fill that gap or bids come up to fill the gap. Okay. So let's go ahead and. Uh, so as far as using MetaTrader versus a broker like this, that's that's really up to you. I mean. Uh, I still trade with MetaTrader and sometimes I'll use Ducoscopy uh, just to see this information and see what's going on, use different indicators and things. But there is no safe, it's not safer to trade one or the other necessarily. You know, 
you might be trading with a MetaTrader brokerage that's using the same liquidity as Ducas Copy. They might have just white labeled them, or you know they're using their sources. There's actually um, FX Open does that. FX Open is a MetaTrader brokerage that uses Ducas Copy's liquidity and price feed. Because Ducas Copy is a very competitive bank and liquidity provider in the business. That's why you can see very good spreads on the euro. You're seeing half a pip, three tenths of a pip. This is on the demo, but the live will be pretty similar. Okay, so I think we've got that, the spread part of things. Most of you seem to understand that now and how the market depth comes into play. But, uh, MetaTrader does not show market depth. Some MetaTrader brokerages have a program that goes with it that can show you market depth. And Ducascopy does not allow U.S. customers anymore, but they have a white. They allow FXDD to offer through them, and I haven't looked into that much though. Okay, well let's go back here. Let's go to the charts now, and let's see if we can explain how price moves. Now that you got a foundation of what makes up price, you should be able to understand now what drives market up, like it did here last night and this morning. And even what just happened here a few minutes ago, what caused price to take off here, you know, 15 pips in a few minutes? What caused that? Well, let's go ahead and take a deeper look at what's going on. Okay, what some people think is that when there are a lot of buyers, that that's all it takes, a lot of buyers. A lot of people think a bunch of people were buying and that's what drove price up. Well, here's the thing. The simple transaction of somebody buying does not drive the price by itself. Because what, what happens when you buy? If you followed what I've been showing you here, if I buy, what happened is I took somebody's offer. So I was matched up. So by buying, that new, just neutralized the position and didn't cause, do anything. And even like I said, if I buy a whole bunch, that alone is also not going to move price up. If I take all this liquidity, Sure, it's going to move the offer price up, but the bid will go nowhere. The only way the bid's going to go up is if the market comes in and offers a better bid price. So, you know, it could be either way. If I buy up all the liquidity and move the ask up, the bids could come in or the offers could come back down and move the price right back down on the offer side. Does that make sense? So see, we don't know which way it's going to go. I mean, just because you, you take all the liquidity on one side does not mean it's going to go that way. Okay, so here's what you, have to, what you have to do. This is how, if you hear about banks and different things manipulating the market, the only way they can truly do that, you know, like you, you hear about just buying a ton of euros and, and moving price up, the only way that that can be done is if they simultaneously buy and offer on the bid, or I mean place bids. So they have to take offers and place bids. Does that make sense? So... If they buy 50 million, they need to place um, a new bid at the uh, you know right behind there where they uh, where they took all the liquidity. That will actually move the price. You follow me? Okay. So let me see if I let me get a little notepad up. Let's just do a little visual example here. Okay. So let's say price is at 1.3300, and you know all the way down to 1. Point, uh, let's say. 3290. You know, there's a bunch of, there's obviously a bunch of orders in between there, but we're just going to say we got a total here, you know, of about, you got 1.5 here, maybe uh, 2.5 million there. So you could go all the way down. We could just say the total is, let's just do the fifth, let's just do 10 million. Okay, so you got 10 million. Let me show you something else here on market depth. They do this for you. They go through and add up all the, the, uh, the bids in the book, add up all the liquidity, and then tell you the total liquidity at, and the average price. So you see they've already kind of done that. They're saying for price to go down to 0.5, or you know, at an average price of 0.5, there's 207 million. So I'm doing the same thing here for you guys. I'm just going to do a little example. You know, you're basically getting an average, we'll say, of 1.3295 with 10 million, okay? Um, now, what's gonna happen is if I sell 10 million, 
if I click sell, take 10 million at the bid price, take all those bids, price will move down to here. It will move the bid down to 1.3290, right? But now let's say over here, let's get the ask side up. Let's say this is 3302. We'll do the same thing down here. It's 1.32. Uh, actually not going to see those. Those are orders that you won't see until the market moves down. Okay, but anyways, let's just say I do hit that bid. Well, what's going to happen is price is going to be 1.3290 slash, you know, offer 1.3302. I've just caused a 12 pip spread in the market, and I need to close that gap faster than everybody else. Otherwise, my, my 10 million that I just sold is going to go into a drawdown when the market comes right back up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to place an offer. So you know we'll place an offer at 1.3292, for example. Now I've shrunk the gap. I've secured a 10 pip move in the market and placed an offer here, hoping that the market's not going to go back up. Now retail traders like you and I, we're not going to be able to go in and do this strategy. What I'm just showing you here is the concept that's happening, you know, either with banks doing this or just the market itself uh, causing this reaction. So, sure, I could go sell 10 million and go put a 10 million offer back in, or maybe a 5 million offer at 92, but price could easily fill that and go back up if the market wants to, uh, you know, if the pressure on the market is to go long and, and drive the trend back up. So, what? What a liquidity provider or a bank is going to do is put a heavy, a strong bit, a strong offer in. They're not going to just put probably 10 million here. If they've sold 10 million, they might put an offer, you know, 5 million at that price. They place another offer at, uh, you know, one pip higher than that. They might put another 5 million there. They're going to put in these, you know, they're going to put in a bunch of these orders to protect their short position. Because like I told you here, they, they sold all this liquidity, sold it at 32, 9, all the way down to 32, 90, 10 million, and they've put offers in now to secure that move, but then also to try to prevent the market from going up. This is what real market resistance is all about. It's, actually, it's, it's actual offers on the market. That's what causes real resistance. And what causes real support? Bids. It's bids on the market. Okay, so let's see if we can make some more sense of this on the charts now. Okay, so what I've been showing you mostly is the internal workings of it, uh, you know, where there's actually bids and offers manipulating it, uh, manipulating the price. Let me, sh let me explain to you now too with uh, the other side of it I, I mentioned earlier is limit orders. It doesn't always have to be somebody manipulating the market like I just demonstrated there. It could also be somebody with a limit order above resistance. Maybe somebody wants to sell up here. They're waiting for this breakout and then they're going to sell. It could be that they're long down here. You might be a buyer thinking, okay, if it breaks out above here, I'm going to take profit here. It also could be a limit order just right at resistance or just before resistance. That's why a lot of times you see price come really close to a resistance level and then bounce off. It's because there are limit orders here. Limit orders must be filled or deleted if price is going to move higher. Okay. This is just the volume indicator right in the platform, on the Ducascopy platform. Okay, so follow me here on this one. This is real. This is the part that will hopefully make everything make sense. Um, as far as why you know the market has resistance and support, let's just go. Let's just uh, move over here a bit. Oops. Let's move over to this little previous breakout that happened here just a little bit ago. Um, you know, right here where I've drawn this line. Oops. Let me get a different color in here so we can tell what we're looking at. Okay, so you've got this support level. You've got the market that was ranging, you know, bouncing back and forth there for a while, and then it finally broke down. What caused the price to move down like that? Well, if you follow me so far, 
the only thing that could possibly do that is somebody taking the liquidity on the bid and then offers catching up, you know, new offers showing up right behind that. That's the only thing that can drive this down. So what, uh, you know, what usually happens here is there was not a lot of bids. When the price came to right here, there was not a lot of bids. The market depth wasn't very, it was what we call thin. There was a, it, was, it wasn't a lot of liquidity, so it was easy for mark, the market to go down. It was easy for the market to be hitting the sell, you know, because every second here we watch this, somebody's hitting buy and sell. It's just constantly going back and forth. Now, the only thing that's going to drive price down, up or down, is um, when there's whichever side has the least amount of support or resistance. If, and I'm talking about as far as order support, the actual liquidity support. So if, some, if it's sell, buying and selling back and forth are constantly, if more of these bids are getting taken up and there's not a lot of bids coming back in, price is going to move down like it did here. If we could go back in time and see what's happening, it's, there was a lot of people taking the bids and there wasn't a lot of bids to have to, uh, you know, causing the support. There was less bids than offers and that's what allowed the price to just naturally make its move down. And as it was moving down, it was easy for the price to move through those bids. Well, other traders came in and adjusted their, their offers. They wanted to offer the best price, and they keep moving it down until they get to the bottom here. And then finally the offers start getting filled. So that's when the support is generated. So right down here, new support level is generated because at that point, there might have been a bunch of bids right here. There could have been too many bids here for the market to push lower. There might have been too many bids. Um, or this is the point when more offers were getting taken, and that's what was causing new bids to have to show up at higher prices, driving the price back up. Okay, let's take a quick breather here and <laughs> make sure everybody's following me. This is probably very new to what you're familiar with as far as understanding what's driving price what's really behind this thing. So I'm going to make sure we answer some questions before we continue. So if you guys have any questions, let me know. I can already see some here. Let me catch up and answer those. So yeah, Kenny says FX Open, for example, has extra software so you can see market depth. So they're a MetaTrader broker that allows you to see it with a separate program. Um, I'm not sure on that with FXCM acting as a liquidity provider. They might to some of the smaller different brokerages. It's kind of how Ducascopy does it. In fact, I think even FXCM uses Ducascopy as one of their sources. I mean, it's just there's a lot of different liquidity providers they can pick and choose from. They just, you know, they have minimum requirements. Some of them, you know, like CurrentX wants $10 million. Uh, to be set up with a liquidity provider with them. I mean, so you know that's why some brokerages don't have very good spreads. They don't have the funding to go in and set up all these relationships with different sort of liquidity providers. Others like Ducascopy, they've got extremely good, you know, competitive spreads because not only are they are doing centralized liquidity, but they are plugged in to most you know major liquidity sources and banks. They've got a lot of partner relationships. They've been around for a long time. Someone's saying, where did, I, where did you get your info? I'm totally in the dark here. Yeah, this stuff, like I say, you, you don't really see people explaining this part very much because most people that are you're learning from are just straight marketers. They have no clue what they're talking about half the time. If they even attempted to explain this, they wouldn't know what they're, what they're doing. But I actually we did work with a bank and a, and a brokerage, two different brokerages, and when I managed money, I got linked up to the traders and dealing, you know, I made relationships with the dealers so that, you know, I had to understand this stuff in order to trade big money. You can't just go in and sell 500 lots. If I did that, I, just like I showed you, that would hurt me because if I go take all the bids, yeah, I'll move price down for a minute, but it's, the market's going to have that knee-jerk reaction if I don't go back in and cover it with the offers and try to protect that. Or if I 
don't go in and slowly ease into my position. There's a lot of different strategies they taught me when I started managing the, that kind of money that I was managing, and that's what that's where I learned all this stuff. This is not me just guessing and somehow figuring it out by watching price. So let's see. Let me make sure we've got all these questions answered before we move on. So for me, the reason I, I stopped you know, trading 18 hours a day and, and managing funds and all of that is that's really not what I wanted to get into trading for. I didn't get into Forex to watch my charts 24-7 basically. So I did that for a couple of years and I just got burnt out and found it much less stressful and, and, uh, and much nicer. You know, I don't want to spend all of my time just watching charts. It was much... Uh, I found it much nicer to I'm more you know do more of swing trading and occasionally do some day trades and spend more of my time developing systems now and I enjoy doing that more than I do staring at my charts 18 hours a day <laughs> so that's why I I've kind of changed some of you might find the same thing you might get trading get things figured out start making good money but then you'll find that you don't want to spend all of your time you know day trading and watching charts so you might adapt your strategy to work a different way or might do something different in the markets. Okay, so Yep, somebody just made gave us a really good little example here. Um Let's see. First, let me answer this. If I believe it's. I had no idea when I trade one or three lots, as I do sometimes, that I'm actually taking real participation in the market. I thought we were speculating just in the sidelines. Well, yeah, James, that's the thing. Some brokerages do act that way. What happens is if you do, you know, take fifth, you know, a million or you know, a standard lot, ten standard lots. There are some brokerages. There's not many of them out there still, but there are some brokerages that your order does not do anything with the market. They act as a bucket shop, um, and they're actually just taking your order in-house on the opposite side. They're not even taking liquidity. Your order doesn't take liquidity. But that's why you don't want to trade with that brokerage because it's a big conflict of interest. You want to trade with an ECN or a brokerage that's giving you the raw spread and just charging you a commission per trade. And that way, yes, you are participating in the markets and you do have an effect on the market. Now you're not going to be, you're not most likely going to be the one driving the market. You know, your little orders going in are not going to have a huge influence on which way price goes. Um, but at least you know that you're not going to be manipulated by the, you know, by the market maker, the brokerage that's doing those type of things. And so here you go. James was saying, uh, I once read, it's like a building. As the limits push up, they are breaking through an imaginary ceiling like a floor in a building. So as you said, they push up. As they push up, you, uh, they place big orders behind them to rebuild the floor below them. So that's exactly right. They can't just go break the ceilings in the building and hope to be able to climb up the building. You know, it's, you got to have new floors rebuilt below them to keep, you know, to keep them pushing up. So that's a little good little example James has given us here. Okay. With my swing trading, you know, I'm mainly using the things we've taught with Momentix and that I've taught in our our different workshops and things. But uh, the key thing is kind of what we talked about. I don't know if you, if you guys made it to our last webinar uh, in the middle of last week, but we talked about the biggest failure for traders is giving up too soon and timing. A lot of times, you know, traders will start trading a system after a huge bull run, you know, a huge profit run, and they start at the worst time. And then they lose money and they give up before it's about to take off again. So what I what I had to learn and adapt to uh, with any all of my trading really is that you've got to stick it stick with it. 
You can't be changing your strategy every other week. And you can't be uh, pushed out of the market from some drawdown. You've got to stick with it. And so there's a lot of different things that go into that that we teach our members, but you've got to have the right risk parameters and you've got to have the right mindset when you go into this or it doesn't matter what you're doing, day trading or swing trading, it won't work. So there are some things you can do, Hal, with market depth to be able to judge if it's a, which direction to trade or if it's a good time to trade or not. Um, I've tried building different systems to automate the process, but it's something that you really, you know, to really to really do well with that approach, you've got to have you got to have some pretty decent skin in the game as far as the sizes that you're trading. So I, you know, I was able to do some of that when I managed money, but with retail trading accounts, you can see here it takes a lot. I mean, on the on the big currencies like euro dollar, if you want to take up the whole book. Even that's only going to move the price two pips, and that's going to take 266 million in currency, 2,600 lots. So you're not going to be able to do too much with small orders. And you know, when you wait, if you wait it out a few hours, some of this will start to diminish as you get into the Asian trading zone, and, or if you go look at some of these other currencies that are not very popular, you know, there's a lot less liquidity there. See, there's only 10 million. Um, so that's why some of these currencies are more likely to be manipulated. Uh, but also at the same time, you've got, uh, you know, you've got to have people in there with you. You can't just be the only one in there trying to take bids and offers and move it around. You're not by yourself. You're not going to really make any money doing that, right? Because if you're constantly placing bids and taking the offer, you're you're not making any money. You're just breaking even as you do that. Okay. What's the difference between a bucket shop and a dealing desk? Well, a dealing desk, some people are, get confused where they think a dealing desk is a bucket shop, and that's not always the case. Sometimes there can be, you have a perfectly, you know, perfectly fine brokerage that runs a dealing desk, and what they're doing is just matching up orders and confirming, you know, that the liquidity is there and, and, um, a lot of that's been automated now nowadays, but but they're just making sure they're matching up orders with other traders internally. So there's a lot of brokerages that process more of their volume to centralized, like the centralized liquidity approach, than they do to outside sources. So that's why they have the dealer platform set up. But there are others that don't, you know, don't, don't look at it that way. They have a dealing desk that does pull tricks like, you know, filling your orders late because they don't have the liquidity there, so they offer they take you and match you up with some other limit order that's higher or lower, um, or against their own positions, what they're willing, where they're willing to put a bid or offer in for you, and those are those broke the bucket shop brokerages we're talking about. So you just got to be careful. You know, you could even ask us about different brokerages if we've heard of them or what we think, but uh, but that's the difference. Now there can be some. Um, brokerages set up that are using real liquidity and are using dealing desks. But most of these ECNs and the, the ones that are going to match you up with just the actual liquidity in the market are going to be using an automated process for that, whether it's the ECN or um, straight through processing, STP, all that kind of stuff is, is where they automate the dealing desk piece in the, in the, in the process. Yeah, if you want to see more information about Momentix, I could probably post you, or for me maybe can post you the link at just tradewestforex.com slash Momentix. Okay, so someone's asking about how about when news is released, when the price moves 50 to 100 pips, what about floors and sellings in those situations? Well, that's the same exact thing here. Let me, let me go and demonstrate that for you. I mean, we could even just use this example and just pretend like this is a news move, right? Okay, so what happens during news? Well, first, 
you guys have probably seen how the spread will widen, right? Even with the good ECM brokerages, good good ECM brokerage, the spread will widen. If it doesn't widen, you probably are seeing a fixed spread uh, from a brokerage, and you're probably not going to get filled at the prices they're saying they're shown. But what will happen is the spread will widen during news. Sometimes 20 or 30 pips. Sometimes you know five or ten. It just depends. And what does that depend on? Everything comes back to the bids and offers. If the spread widened 50 pips, it's because somebody took, uh, either took their order off, they did not want to have a bid or offer during the news, which that's most of the time what's happening uh, right before the news. The spreads will ride and be right before the news comes out because people, like these guys that are bidding and offering, don't want to get caught in that whipsaw. So they'll remove their orders. And when they remove them, that widens the spread to the next available prices. Now, when they... Uh, price or the news comes out, all that we're seeing there is the reaction to the news. If, if, the, if people think it's gonna, price is going to go up, you'll see everybody, you know, a ton of traders will start buying and taking the liquidity from the, uh, you know, if it's the ask side, they'll start taking the liquidity. That's going to move the price up. And then to do that, you know, this could be, it could be anybody doing that. It could be institutional traders, hedge funds. They could be buying the news you know, really heavily, and then just, again, putting bids in, following their orders, and protecting those positions. That's, it's the exact same process that's happening during the news. But I'm glad you brought that up, because that's exactly the thing, is that's why the spread is widening like it does during news. And that's why the spread widens in any case. Why does the spread widen, you know, when the markets go flat towards the end of the day? It's because there's less traders during that time that want a bid and offer there, so they'll delete them before their day is over, take them off the market, and the spread widens, naturally. Makes perfect sense, right? Is there a difference between the last price in Forex and the last price in futures? So I, what you're referring to is the last price that was traded at, that the liquidity was filled at, and I don't know if they still have this, the indicator for that, but, you know, the one I still use is the AD, accumulation and distribution. And so what this line tells us is kind of what you're saying is the last, uh, the last price or last price that the market was traded at, it's not exactly the same thing, but let me just show you. So basically, as this blue line moved, if it moved up or it moved down, you know, if it moved down, that was distribution, and it means more traders were selling, um, or that the liquidity that was entering the market was uh, was from people or traders selling at the bid. If it moves up, it's from traders buying at the ask price. So that kind of tells you, I mean, they used to have another indicator in here that could show you bid and ask volume, and you could see the last price that was traded at, you could use the tick chart, you know, and you could see that. I mean, and you can kind of see what happened here. So, you know, it went from 28.79 to 43, so there was basically 15 million uh, that was bought at this uh, average price, or you can see, is uh, 33.126. So, see, there was 15 million that moved the price up like that. It's not quite the same as futures, though. See, futures is is a centralized, or a, uh, has a um, I'm trying to think of the word. It's basically there's a place where they record all of that, so they know if at the exact price exactly what happened at the last price, how many, um, how much liquidity was taken at that price. So in Forex, the only place you can really get close to that is on Dukascopy here with this, looking at the tick chart and the, and the volume indicators. Let me see if they still got the, it didn't seem like a, they had it on the volume, but it used to be able to set the volume and you could say bid and ask. I don't think they have those parameters anymore. Well, they do have it for on balance volume. So see, I can go to on balance volume, and I can set it at the bid. Make it red here. 
and then I can go put it on again with I'll make it on the ask price in blue. Okay, so now you'd be seeing, you know, when a price moves up, how much of it was traders selling at the bid and, at, and buying at the ask price. So you can go back here and see that. This is not as cut and dry as like the futures market. So I don't know if that really answered what you're looking for, but. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, the last price that the market was traded at could be the bid, um, either has to be the bid or the ask. But um, when you're looking at the Forex, the market can tick. You know, when it ticks up and ticks down, you'll see that a lot of times uh, the spread on that next tick changes. So you see it, it goes from here, and the next price, there was a new bid and a new ask at the same time. So it can almost happen simultaneously here. A new bid price shows up and a new ask price shows up. And that's like I say, it's because what, what traders are doing is when they're taking the ask price, they're putting a bid in at the same exact time to make sure price does in fact move up or move down, whichever way they're going. So it is different. I think that's what you're looking for is how it's different than the futures last price. What people, okay, so what you're seeing in Forex when you see last price, is this just telling you the last, you know, the last bid price that the market was at. It's just telling you, you know, the last, before the, you see where the price is at now, where the last bid price was at. So, I mean, that's different. You're sure, you know, here we are at 11.8. If the price moves up to 11.9, then it's just telling you the last price was 8, so you know that the last move was up. It's the same thing. Let me just show you on, on MetaTrader how they do it. Instead of telling you the last price, they just color the, um, the quote. Okay, let me show you this real quick here. Okay, so so here you are. See, you've seen the market uh, watch on on MetaTrader. The way that they cover the last price is they just tell you, or they just color it in red or blue. If the last price was higher, they color it red. If the last price was lower, they cover color it in blue. So that's what you're talking about with last price in forex. That's kind of different than maybe what I was explaining, but. Okay, so I think uh, we're going to get close here to wrapping up. If you guys have any other questions, I know this was a maybe a more advanced topic, and you can definitely review the recording. Um, we do record all of these, but this co these concepts are really important to understand, just so that you you don't get confused by what maybe some others are teaching you about the markets. And it's I think it's nice to understand what you know what support and resistance really is. Okay. Just because the market, for example, here came down really strong, went back up, just because this formed a little, you know, fractal support level or candle support level, does not mean that the market is going to have a hard time breaking that. That it's a true support level, especially as more time goes by. Well, you know, what did we say here? When this when this kind of thing happens, um, there were a lot of bids that were not filled or more offers were being filled here and the price went up. That's all that meant. it means. It does not mean that this is a level where the price is going to have a difficult time in the future. That's why support and resistance doesn't always you know, work out that way. Look what happened over here. The price just took off and screamed right through that level. Why did that happen? Well, it's because over here, sure, there was uh, more buyers uh, you know, and more bids moving at, on the way up and maybe more bids in the way to move down. But when it came over here, that was no longer the case. Either the market was uh, more thin on the bid side, or there were more people taking the bids. That's all that that means. 
it doesn't this little price doesn't really mean any much on its own so it's nice to understand what is really going on and this also helps you understand that uh, you got to be careful with breakouts you know when you see the classic break out and then turn the other way let's just go over here for example okay look at what happened right here here's a resistance level that the market pushed through and then went all the way back down a lot of traders got stopped out right here they closed their trades out they got they had stop losses in here and they got taken out and then the market went, went right back down it's because they think that this is a really strong level that it's not going to do that but that's like I've taught you now that's not always going to be the case especially if the market's just kind of slowly moving through here eventually it found the uh, you know the resistance of offers up here there was some offers but um, right at this level the offers were not there or the market was strong enough to fill the offers but here it was not and that's what pushed the price back down now we covered this concept in more detail in our one of our workshops which our members have access to we we have some different resources you can use to actually see where those barriers are at you know you might see that um, there's a big block of uh, limit orders right here so if you're selling you would know I don't want to get out here this is not a breakout you want to wait and see if these orders on sitting on top of the market get filled or not or get deleted and that's where you put your stop just above there so we had a workshop where we taught all about this concept you can uh, and, you know our members have access to that if you're interested in something like that just let me know here on the chat or uh, you can email us at info at tradewithforex.com but that's what you that's the only thing you could really have as a forex trader you know is the price itself and what the bid and ask is doing which that stuff like I say won't help you so much um, as a retail trader because you're not trading big enough trade you know lot sizes to affect the market but things like this seeing where it's at outside of the depth more than just these couple levels deep seeing where the big blocks of orders are at can help you a lot as a swing trader and even as a day trader you know I could go bring up the resource now and I could see it might look something like this and if I was sitting in here I could range trade this all day long you know and then eventually you'll see that that block it will come to an end and uh, it might get moved up and then I'll just adjust my orders accordingly okay so what we might talk about this concept of uh, you know with seeing the future prices future limit orders rather than uh, just the market depth we might be able to cover that maybe in next week's or later this week I guess um, but we'll let you know I'm think I'm gonna wrap this one up and um, actually I'll answer these couple last questions here and then we're gonna wrap this up yep that's right James when price widens say on the euro New Zealand at the end of the US session that's because there is low liquidity and orders are pulled so until orders come in price doesn't know where to go that's right it's exactly what causes the market to go sideways flat spreads widen all of that so a lot of traders are masking their positions is market depth useful for medium to long-term trading well that's they brought up another point there there's something called iceberg orders that uh, when you start trading big lot sizes that's the way orders usually want to set them up you set those up and you also set up a you know a lot of traders set up stealth mode and things just so the market doesn't see their limit orders so yeah that's where that's why you can't use market depth by itself um, as a strategy it can only be just another indicator because you know smart traders out there know what they're doing and they don't want to be taken advantage of by traders just strictly looking at order flow Um, Keith, maybe you can probably send in or go on our live chat with that. We can help you find out which workshop. I'm trying to remember which one it was exactly, but it'd be better if you, we just you just connect with with us on our live chat. We can help you find what you're looking for there. Okay, guys. Well, hopefully, hopefully, what I've taught you today um, just helps you understand the markets more, and uh, I think it's really good to you know weed out the myth and get rid of that myth that you're you might 
you know, most people believe this, they don't know what's really going on, and just having this foundational understanding of what's driving the markets and what drives price can make a big difference in uh, the way you, you know, the way you take your positions and the way you uh, trade. So we'll cover, like I said, we'll probably cover this stuff in more detail in the next session. I'll probably see if we can uh, even bring out that resource, at least demonstrate it a little bit and show you how you can use this stuff uh, as a retail trader. So thanks, everybody, for coming. We'll get this recording up, and uh, we'll also uh, update the blog this week with the, next, with the next post and let you know if the webinar, the webinar should probably be Friday this week instead of move to Monday. So thanks again, everybody. Have a great week trading.